Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to our Bible class. Uh, I'm John Shackelford. Joining me is Bob Ray. And we are excited today to be giving you session four lesson on how we are trying to be better equipped everyday disciples. Today, our class is focused on part two of a godly financial life, and it's focused on uh, the art of stewardship. And we have uh, consistently tried to remind each week that we're making a commitment personally and inviting you to join us on the journey of personally improving all of us, our actions and our thoughts and our heartfelt works uh, to be everyday disciples. We're being intentional about doing that. We're covering the seven key areas that we've identified. We've covered our soul life, and now we're headed into the final section of financial life. Uh, next week, Lord willing, we'll dig into uh, improving our home life. Uh, we're excited about bringing the series with you, uh, to you, and being engaged with you uh, online. I ask that uh, if you've got the time, uh, please uh, take a few minutes and share this link uh, with uh, three of your friends, your family or your neighbors, and invite them to come in and enjoy uh, the information that we're sharing and hopefully you'll be blessed by this learning experience. So before we uh, go any further, uh, let me take us to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we love you. Uh, we are trying to be better servants of yours. We are trying to learn about key areas as where we need to improve as everyday disciples. Father, thank you for the opportunities of working with our brother Bob. Thank you for his love for you and for his family. Thank you for his work. Uh, in all endeavors. Father, as we go into the study today, uh, may we uh, be clear. May we offer information. And Father, may you bless uh, us as we strive to share your word. Father, thank you so much for being our Savior and for sending your Son to die for us. Father, we love you. We need you in our life. And Father, I just ask that in all things that we do only one thing, and that is to give you the glory. I pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Good morning, uh, brothers and sisters. Good to see you again this week. Um, thank you, Shaq, for the introduction, the opening prayer. Um, I thought last week's class was really good, and I appreciated your input and um, assistance with that class and your viewpoint. Uh, as we go throughout this class, again, don't hesitate to jump in whenever um, some uh, thought strikes you. Thank you. So last week, as uh, Shaq mentioned, we studied financial life. We have broken the financial life up into two buckets that, that I defined. First being the heart of a giver, and we spoke last week just about the fundamental basis that we all need to operate under, that God owns everything, that he supplies everything that we have, uh, everything that we need, and scripture tells us that he will give us everything we need. Maybe not everything we want, uh, but many times our wants are not aligned with what our needs are, um, and God has a bigger plan and has knowledge of what we really truly need. As far as our giving is concerned, then we know it is commanded, but it's also essential in many different ways and we studied about that. And then just in, in terms of the heart of a giver, just the example that we set to those around us through how we work hard, through whether we're content with our station in life. And certainly being content just doesn't mean that we just sit around and we don't do anything. We're still expected to work. We're still expected to um, strive. Um, it doesn't mean we're lazy. It just means that whatever God has supplied us with, uh, we're happy in our station in life and not always wanting material possessions or always looking for the material or the physical. 
uh, but trying to stay focused on the, the spiritual. And then finally, just the godly, uh, big G, little g counsel that we have, whether that be through God and his word, uh, which is obviously vital and critical to our lives, but also being willing to search out for counsel of those that are more mature in the faith. I think that's one of the great things about the, the church itself um, and how, it, how God set it up, how it's structured, uh, that the, the more mature of the congregation are to, to lead the younger of the congregation and self perpetuate itself. Uh, and that's why uh, we're so blessed that the uh, North Tampa Church of Christ, they have a good mix where we have some that are more mature in the world, but we also have a lot of young ones running around. Um, those we know that, that we need to train them upright because they're the future of the church. The second act um, or second part of financial life that I want to get into is a little bit shorter this week than last week, but this is actually the act of stewardship. So last week, again, we, we talked about kind of uh, how our hearts should be, how our mindset should be. So this week, we're going to specifically focus on the knowledge that what God has given us, and we're going to look to how we should manage what he's given to us. One of the scriptures I read uh, in preparation for this class was Proverbs 22.2. It says, the rich and the poor have a common bond. The Lord is the maker of them all. So again, it doesn't matter what station of, in life you, you are. Um, as I mentioned last week, whether you're rich or poor, um, at some point in time, um, every knee will, will bow. Um, and the Lord is, is, as it says, the maker of it all. The Lord is above everything, and we need to keep that in mind. And then Matthew 25, 14 to 30, you know, we've, um, for those that have been in, in the church for a while, we've heard this many, many times, this story, uh, but it's so applicable here to our study about stewardship. And, and specifically, you know, this, the question is, how am I managing the master's assets while waiting for his return? So he's given us gifts. Um, some of us might have five, they may be two, they may be one. Uh, this story specifically speaks of talents um, being financial in nature, uh, but certainly could be applied to, as, as Shaq mentioned last week, just the time that we have, whether we can be a song leader, we can be a Bible teacher, whether we can be called to be an elder. Um, again, this, this story, I believe, speaks just primarily to the financial aspect, but certainly can be also interpreted and also, you know, applies to how we have Whatever gifts we've been given, whether it's you know, financial in nature or non-financial in nature, uh, how are we using those gifts? And are we using to benefit the king kingdom? And that's the, the big point at the end. And just to refresh our memory as we go through this story where the master gave five talents, two talents, one talents to three individual people. And it's, it's a case study in what they did with those talents. So two people, were active in those talents uh, and, and in applying them, employing them for the greater good. Um, one that was given five came back with 10 uh, and the master was happy with them. The one that had two came back with four and the master was happy with them. The one that only had one didn't do anything with his talents and the master was not happy at all. And so as we go into this study, I'd like, to, like you to keep that passage in mind. The first aspect I think of stewardship starts with uh, budgeting. And there's a, there's a quote that uh, is attributed to Benjamin Franklin that I've used multiple times over my business career. And that is, if you fail to plan, you plan to fail. Um, one of the things that I posted on Facebook at the beginning of this year that I had really never done before is to really sit down and do a spiritual plan uh, in terms of whether it be Bible study or uh, what I was going to be studying, what I wanted to get to, or where I wanted to be at certain milestones throughout the year. Um, and in terms of your financial life, and in terms of budgeting, it's essentially the same thing. Uh, you know, in, in, again, in my business world, we actually start, we're on a calendar year in terms of the company I work for, we actually start in early September every year, uh, and don't finish up until most times in December sometimes. So we're spending four months, not you know, full-time every day, but aspects of, and 
certain portions of four months, putting together a financial plan for the upcoming year, looking at what our revenues are going to be, looking at what the expenses are going to be, uh, all those kind of things. And then as we go into, say, 2020, which we're in right now, looking at here's what we plan to be and where are we in reality. Again, you can apply that to a spiritual plan, which I'm doing for myself this year. You can also do it on a budget specifically for your finances. So how much money do you make? Um, and then where does that money go? Currently, where do you want it to go? How do you get from a point A to point B? And then the third bullet point I had there is just the financial, the budget is essentially your financial roadmap. So if you, if you want to think about the Bible, and reading of the Bible and being obedient to the Bible as being your spiritual roadmap to get your get into heaven someday. And again, I almost said earn. We obviously don't earn it our way to heaven. Jesus has um, accomplished that for us. But being obedient um, to realize that that promise that God has given to us that, that the Bible helps us get there. Uh, and the Bible speaks a lot on finances, as we we learned last week as well as this week. Uh, but putting together that budget um, allows you to kind of identify how much you're going to make and where you want each of uh, where the various expenses are going to be. Um, you know, Bob, the, the challenge that I've always had is using the self-discipline to, first of all, get started to build a budget. But then the challenge number two of that effort is to, again, be so rigorous uh, that you capture the expenses that you have. And it's all part of us being willing to make an effort to do that. Just as we are given opportunities uh, I think we need to step up and to be willing to build a budget and to use the self-discipline to follow uh, putting God first and seeing what he will do if you but make the effort. And I appreciate so much the, the start point of, hey, if you want to put some discipline, uh, spiritual discipline, in your journey with Christ, then here is a really good way to begin. And that is both financial uh, benefits and resources coupled with uh, making time available uh, to be in God's word. So thanks for, for bringing up the importance uh, of budgeting. Yeah. That's that's absolutely true and a great point. Um, Self-discipline, you know, last week we studied about the, the heart of a giver. Really depends on, you know, it, it kind of identifies or indicates where your heart is. Obviously, the our entire walk with God, uh, with Jesus, is one where we have to take up the cross and deny ourselves. Right. And certainly as we apply that to our finances, we need to do so as well. Um, not going to read Luke 21, 1 through 4. We talked about it last week, uh, about the widow putting um, her faith in God that he would supply uh, by giving everything she had. Um, I did think it was interesting, though, as I was studying, I pulled another scripture out, 2 Corinthians 9, 6 to 7. Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each one must do as he has purposed in his heart, not grudgingly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. So I think many times um, as we go throughout um, worship sessions, as we you know, go surround the table, this verse of scripture um, really pops up a lot in terms of being a cheerful giver. But the, the word that I actually popped out of me as I was studying for this, as it reply, applies to budgeting, was purpose. Um, so not only are you, not, not only does this scripture talk about giving, but this individual in this um, verse that, that you're talking about has already purposed in their heart. So at some point in time, you know, as I interpret it, 
Um, it's certainly this individual has sat down and came up with what they want to give back to the God, back to God, um, which you know is is somewhat in line with the budget and how they would, you know, you would go through and identify the various aspects, one of of which is the the gift to God. Thanks. And then Proverbs 24, 3 to 4 is just by wisdom a house is built, by all understanding it is established, and by knowledge the rooms are filled with all precious and rich, rich, uh, pleasant riches. And I just highlighted wisdom there. Um, and essentially the budget, you know, I thought this was a good quotation as well. Budget is just telling your money where you want it to go. And this is kind of hitched on your point a little bit, Shaq. Telling your money where you want it to go rather than where it went. So, you know, as I apply this to my spiritual walk, um, in past years, you know, I've tried to grow as a Christian, but how do I know how much I've grown? How do I know whether I've reached that finish line unless I had some measuring stick, which is why I set up a spiritual plan this year. In the same manner, how do you know if you're really managing your finances appropriately, if you don't have a budget, if you don't have some kind of measuring stick uh, that you're, uh, having regular checkups against just to see how you're doing and where you want to get to. You know, you, as it applies to say giving to the church, you know, a lot of people are, are suffering uh, financially right now with the coronavirus, the unemployment, uh, the impact that it's had on the, the country. And so, you know, finances are probably on the forefront of a lot of individuals mind these days. Um, you know, once we come out of this, as you come out of this, maybe, you know, you start, taking a look at your budget and maybe you can only give a little bit but how do you work it slowly but surely and increase your giving by being more uh, by you know being wiser by employing more uh, managerial aspects over the rest of your budget to lessen where that money goes and or just keeping track of, of where it goes i'm kind of in the same boat as you uh shack you know when the pre-coronavirus days, it was easy to just go out and grab some food somewhere. Um, yeah. You do that two, three times a week, and all of a sudden you get to the end of the month, and it all adds up. So just being mindful of where it goes is super important. Excellent. Excellent. And it's one of those things where, again, we are in a, a position now, better than ever, where we can identify those things that are essential and those things which are not essential. And we certainly are in a slowdown mode and we need to just plug in to using this as an opportunity to make an assessment and, and be real about it and just see uh, what you have, what you need. And then uh, I love your point about purposing I firmly believe that if we purpose it, then God will help us to make the goal because we put the energy in to purpose and plan. And clearly, one of these slow down modes right now, uh, let's take a look at our finances and how we're spending God's money. Yep, very good. <clears throat> Over on the, uh, the second <clears throat> bullet point that is, is saving. So this kind of gets back to budgeting. Budgeting kind of encompasses um, all the upcoming points. So there's three other points that I have inclusive of savings that kind of rule up into your overall budget. Um, Proverbs 21, 20 says the wise store up choice food and olive oil, but fools gulp theirs down. And then in the New American Standard, the same scripture says, there's precious treasure and oil in the dwelling of the wise, but a foolish man swallows it up. So essentially, this is kind of gets back to, um, oh, it's right there. Genesis 41 is one of the other things that I read about as I was studying for this. Kind of um, popped out at me as an example of studying for, to some degree, or not saving to to some degree. Um, this is the story of Joseph and Pharaoh's dream. Obviously, Pharaoh had the dream. Um, he saw seven fat cows, um, followed by seven lean cows. Then he had another dream, seven years, or seven healthy heads of grain, followed by seven thin heads of grain. And obviously then he wasn't able to interpret his dream, so he called upon Joseph. 
Joseph was able to come to him and say, hey, essentially, this is telling us that we're going to have seven years of abundance followed by seven years of famine. And Pharaoh was so impressed with his ability to interpret the dream that he put him over his entire household. And we know from the story that essentially what Joseph did is he carved off a portion of everything that was produced over the seven years of abundance, put it in savings, for lack of a better word, or put it, stored it up, so that during the seven years of famine, um, they were able to pull from that supply. And, and our savings is, is very similar to that. Um, again, as I've mentioned, the, the time that we live through right now is very challenging for a lot of people, um, being laid off or um, furloughed, a lot of unexpected, you know, a lot of uncertainty in terms of what the future holds. One of the things I, as I was studying for this again, I looked out on a website called moneywise.org and it said uh, from a recent report, only 40% of Americans had enough savings to cover a thousand dollar unexpected expense. So that means that about 60% of the individuals would have to go into some kind of debt um, in order to just cover that a thousand bucks. Um, I put some goals there uh, in terms of kind of what the experts in the field in terms of budgeting and financial management always kind of throw out in terms of what we should be saving up. And again, we're not, we're not saving up to have treasures on this earth. We're set saving up to be prudent uh, managers of financials, God, uh, uh, God's finances and God's blessings that he give, has given us. And you know, the one thing that um, I'll share a little bit of a personal story here. Uh, me individually, I've never been fired from a job and I've never been laid off from a job. So I've spent, you know, 30 years now working in the account accounting industry. And yet, um, the one thing that always haunts me is losing my job and not being able to supply for my family. And thankfully, God has watched over me all these years and supplied, has supplied that for me. Um, the one thing that you know I've tried to do is live up to these bullet points that we've put here. And I, I think the one thing that I find on this bullet point and then some of the upcoming bullet points is that you know if we don't have our finances in order, um, a lot can go be gone on in the world. And there's always trials and tribulations that are coming, ebbing and flowing in and out of your life. Uh, but as you get certain aspects of your life through God's assistance under control, this would be one of a case here if you had savings set aside, it really affords you peace of mind. And you have to wonder, you know, God's word is, is so profound as we study it. Um, there's so many things that he's called us upon uh, that give us peace that if we would just follow his word, life would be easier. You know, potentially, as we studied last week, it's just, just about being content with what we have versus striving for that next great phone or the next car or whatever the case may be. If we're just willing to be content in that, if we're willing to be diligent with our finances and deny ourselves so that we could put some savings aside, we gain peace of mind, we get, gain a comfort level. Um, Thanks, Bob. That, that's coming from you, sharing that personal experience that it just exemplifies what God can do if we give him the opportunity. Uh, jumping around to the third bullet point, and then I have one more after this, uh, it's just to avoid debt. So um, again, these are getting back to the budgeting, um, the prior one about savings, and then avoiding debt. So this is just, again, ruling up under budgeting. Uh, but they're all, again, speaking to the act of stewardship and how we manage the blessings that God has given us. Proverbs 22, 7 actually says the rich rule over the poor and the borrower is slave to the lender. Um, I had a stat here for debt.org, less than, uh, worried about the numbers themselves, but the fact that it's increasing from 2000 to 2017. Um, and you have to wonder as you, you look around and as we assess 
our life, as we assess our budget, again, we're looking to where is all the money, where is the gifts and the talents that God is giving us, where are they being directed? In a lot of cases, we have control over that. Um, and so we have, to, we have to deny ourselves um, and we have to be diligent um, about where we, you know, we spend that money. Um, I specifically put here about excessive debt can be indicative of several things, uh, whether it be poor stewardship, lack of contentment with what we have, inability to manage money. Um, as I did my studies, you know, it calls out, and if you read the scriptures that I was able to find, I never found anything where it said having debt is a sin. Obviously, there's very few of us that can go out and afford to purchase a house without incurring a mortgage or having some kind of debt. But I think what these verses that I was able to study speak to is maintaining a good balance, maintaining a healthy balance of where our funds are gone at times knowing that debt is going to be needed, uh, but I certainly never found anything about debt being a sin. And again, the last bullet point I, I put was this, this discussion point about avoiding debt is about being wise with what you've been given, um, being a good steward over what you've been given. Absolutely. <laughs> And then finally, um, this is one that I hadn't really thought about, um, about don't co-sign. And actually, it's, um, there's actually quite a few scriptures in, in God's word about it, but I had really never taken and applied it to financial life or really thought about it in this manner. Um, you can see I, I've listed three here, Proverbs, uh, all of them are in Proverbs. They all talk to a man uh, essentially pledging or becoming a guarantor, either to somebody that is a neighbor or to a stranger. Um, I didn't find anything specifically talking about, you know, being a guarantor to family members or something like that. Again, it, it talked about just being a co-signer for a neighbor or a stranger. And I think what it was really trying to get to is a lot of what we just talked about on, on uh, avoiding debt is just, again, being a good steward, being wise about where you put your money. Um, again, debt is debt. So even if it's not your debt directly, uh, it is yours indirectly, and if that individual defaults, then it's going to come back on you. Um, so just be, being cautious. Again, I don't know that it's um, a sin to co-sign for somebody, but I think it's uh, just prudent uh, to watch how much debt you go into, watch how much you co-sign, uh, because as it mentions up here, um, You know, one of the scriptures I, I studied, it talks about being a slave. And essentially, that's where the point that you get is if you get too deep, too underwater uh, with how you're spending, you essentially become a slave and you, you just have no flexibility with your, with your finances anymore. And uh, you lose that peace of mind. You lose that flexibility to be able to give back as you've been, been called to do so. Got it. So again, Shaq, those are the four for this week. A little shorter class um, talking about the act of stewardship um, but again things that I, I think you know maybe we don't always think about enough maybe we don't always study about enough uh, but certainly as we read the study of Matthew and the um, the story about the talents um, certainly uh, God put it in there for a reason and we need to be mindful of of that scripture and make sure that we are managing our finances, that we are being a good steward so that we can be pleasing to our Lord. Bob, thanks so much for uh, highlighting those things. And as, as you went through, uh, there are a couple of takeaways that uh, I had noted here that uh, I, I feel compelled to share uh, based on my experience is also uh, when we're talking about the idea of managing our finances, uh, particularly as a married couple, uh, I would offer the suggestion that the husband and the wife uh, always recognize that you don't need to go alone on making financial decisions. 
uh, I think it is imperative and scriptural that husbands and wives jointly plan their finances. And in my years as a shepherd and as a leader of, of young marriage and old marriage for that matter, uh, where I saw uh, some conflicts come quickly was when the married couple went separate ways on finances to the extent of, of having individual accounts that neither knew uh, what the expenses were or the balance in the account. So just from an old dog here, I would suggest that as you come into stewardship, that you not hesitate uh, if you're married uh, to talk jointly about your budgets and your finances and expenses. And also, Bob mentioned earlier about uh, gifts. I would suggest that either if you're in a congregation like at North Tampa or anywhere you find yourself, uh, be intentional about identifying what are your gifts? What has God blessed you with in terms of talents, knowledge, skills, and ability? Uh, part of this financial and resource planning uh, relates to giftedness. And if you don't know what your gifts are, then you're already uh, with a strike on you. Uh, so just reach out and, and there are tools that are available to help you identify what are your spiritual gifts. And based on some experience I've had, I would also like to share that perhaps uh, with regards to indebtedness that Maybe you should intentionally set goals on how you can get out of debt, or at least how you can best live within the means and the financial resources that you're being provided. Uh, I would encourage all folks to watch out for the plastic fantastic hmm. credit cards. If you are using uh, credit cards out of control, watch out because it is so easy to swipe that card or plug that card and you are spending funds that you may not have to cover the indebtedness. And lastly, I would remind what Bob taught us today that uh, if we purpose and we give cheerfully, then God is going to bless us. And our first fruits need to come first because they are God's blessings to us. And in terms of planning our finances, we need to put God first because as we all can never forget, God's got this. Mm -hmm. Bob, thanks so much for a fantastic series of lessons on financial planning and how to do it in accordance with God's word. I so much appreciate you chalking the lessons full of scripture that we can go back and reflect on as we go down the road on this. So I wanna invite you all uh, to join us next week. Uh, it's my turn uh, to lead here on next week's class of Home Life. And I hope you'll share this with your friends that we're going to have another class and that uh, send them the link and have them join us. Uh, and I just hope that what we're bringing to you is helping each of you uh, to intentionally uh, discipline yourself to be an everyday disciple of Christ. Bob, thanks again. Uh, final words from you, sir. No, I had uh, just... Uh... Hope everybody has a good week. Um, just one final comment. I appreciate your your thoughts about um, specifically as it relates to gifts, looking at your gifts. Um, again, this class was primarily around financial life, but they are so interrelated, the seven yeah. things. We're parsing them out individually just so that we can study them piece by piece, but they all roll up into the, the walk that we have. And in the class, how, how we've kind of titled it with being an everyday disciple. 
Um, they're just, they, they cross over so much that they're hard to, it's hard to separate, but um, we're trying to do our best and hope everybody has a good week and God bless you. Thanks, Bob. Thanks. Bye, buddy.